we were forced to face our mortality and face the preciousness of life mm. and how quickly it can change because we were hearing reports yeah. of deaths every day globally. Yeah. I mean, you could, you turn on CNN and they had a ticker for crying out loud, Yeah, you know, just counting the deaths. I mean, it was just in our faces. Yeah. And so you take those two factors, we were forced to deal with wholesale change. And then we were also confronted with mortality and how precious life is. And that, is making people just go, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Man, what, yeah. what other changes do I want to make? Life's too short to just go get a paycheck. So I think those are your two major factors that the pandemic brought to the table. And all it did was just dig up all that stuff that you and I believe is underneath of us just waiting to come out anyway. And that's yeah. a longing to, to do meaningful work. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I'm your host, Molly Stillman of Still Being Molly, and this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, the companies, and small businesses that are changing the world. Each week, I get to sit down with an entrepreneur, a CEO, nonprofit director, community leader, or just an incredible person who is trying to make a positive impact, not only through their personal life, but also with their career. My goal is to show you that no matter what you do for a living, you can make an impact wherever you are. My guest this week is Ken Coleman. Ken is America's career coach. He is the nationally syndicated radio host of The Ken Coleman Show and a number one best-selling author. He's been featured in Forbes, Fox News, Fox Business Network, The Rachel Ray Show. Since 2014, he has served at Ramsey Solutions, where he offers expert advice to help thousands of people every day discover what they were meant to do and how to land their dream job. Ken's new book, From Paycheck to Purpose, came out November 9th, and it is his own personal story of wandering around without focus early in his career and not feeling like he was enough. He is such an incredible speaker. He is so eloquent and just somebody who really is able to articulate things that so many of us uh, really need to hear. He and I actually had some really weird, small world things in common. We had such a fun conversation. And this is one that I really feel like it's just perfect timing to have this at the end of the year as people are beginning to think about goals for 2022. And that feels so crazy to say 2022. And he is just the kind of conversation that so many people need to hear right now. So I hope you love this conversation. But before we get to my conversation with Ken, I want to thank our partner of the show. And that's Mama Suds. As you know, Mama Suds helps label reading moms create a safe and non-toxic home for their family by creating synthetic free household cleaners. And one of those cleaners is Mama Suds Fine Linen Soap, which is the best thing since sliced bread. You can wash your high quality sheets, linens, delicates, organic fabrics with a fine linen soap to help keep them looking newer and softer longer. All you have to do is use three to four capfuls for a high efficiency machine on a delicate cycle, or if you have a regular machine, just use four to six capfuls. You can head on over to mamasuds.com. That's M-A-M-A-S-U-D-S.com and use the code Molly for 15% off your order. Now on to my conversation with Ken Coleman. Ken, I'm so excited to have you. Welcome to the show. How are you doing, my friend? Molly, I am living the dream. I love it. I'm having a blast. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm so excited to have you here. Um, I've been following uh, your work for uh, quite a few years now, and I just love, love, love the way that you approach career and uh, just passion and purpose and just such a unique perspective of this balance of pursuing passion while also not like sacrificing your paycheck and your family and all the things uh, along the way. So we're going to dive right in. I've got a lot of things I want to talk to you about. But to start off, I'm going to have you give me the Ken 101. So kind of tell Tell us, obviously, we know that you host the Ken Coleman show. You're you're an author. You're a speaker. But at the end of the day, like, who are you and what is the most important role in your life? Well, the most important role in my life is is that of husband and father. Yeah, so that's first and foremost. Yeah. But I would also say that um, that that's the clear priority for me. Yeah. However, I would not put my work role way down the ladder. Yeah, I would say that it's just a a slight bit of space between the two, because I think that if you aren't clear on your role professionally, it can really harm you and your ability to fill your role relationally. Right. Because we just long for a purpose. And I think there's relational purpose and professional purpose. So, uh, but those are the two most, most important roles, because if I had to choose, yeah. which I don't have to, yeah. Uh, but if I had to, 
Well, certainly um, that role, you know, the, the fam is the fam is everything. If I accomplish great things in my professional life, but fail miserably relationally, then I'm a failure. Mm. Mm. Preach it. Preach it. We're already preaching. Um, yeah. So you take obviously an offering a little bit later. I know. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll be collecting tithes and offerings at the end, passing right. the basket. Um, although I don't know if you can do that anymore. Um, anyway, uh, so you are, have this this huge passion for career and family and all those kinds of things. What kind of precipitated that? What led you to this? Because obviously you probably had some careers prior to this career talking about careers. What, what's sort of the, the backstory that led you to where you are now? Yeah, well, certainly the seed of all of this was I'm a pastor's kid and my dad drove that theme home that I was created to do something specifically. Don't miss the will of God for your life. That was mm. the churchies, the Christianese language that I grew up hearing. Yeah. And so because I respected my dad, I respected his position as, as also my pastor. I grew up in a very strong, strong faith and healthy faith community. Yeah. And so this was this glaring need that I grew up going, I got to figure out what God's will for my life is. And what that means, what am I supposed to do with my life? What does God have for me? What's his plan for me? Yeah. So, you know, when you have something like that, that's spoken about all the time, it's modeled, it's a part of your being. As you hear it, you do one of two things. You either accept it or you reject it. And I accepted it. Mm. And so I think that, that that's what drove me to be very ambitious because I wanted to figure out what it was. So kind of ambition was a byproduct of that because I wanted to figure out what it was that I was supposed to do. And then I wanted to do it to everything in my being because I'm a natural performer. That's just kind of what drives me. So that was the seed of it. And so I, I got pretty clear in my mind at the age of 16 that it was a call into political service hmm. and politics. And so I went on that path with everything in my being. By the age of 22, I'm working for the governor of Virginia. You know, wait, who? Fat. Okay, wait, real quick. We got to pause. Who oh, was the governor at the time? Jim Gilmore. Oh my God. So my first job out of college was working for Tim Kaine when he was governor of Virginia. What a yeah, weird, okay. like small... <laughs> Wait, did yeah. you grow up in Virginia? I have so many questions. Uh -huh. Like, what is weird yeah. common interest? Yeah, I grew up in Virginia. I grew up in the uh, Hampton Roads area. So okay. a small town called Smithfield, Virginia. I went right to across the bridge. I went to Christopher Newport University. My brother, this is really going to freak you out. We're going to apologize ahead of time to all of our listeners for this <laughs> rabbit hole. What? I love but, it. Uh, my brother is the head golf coach for the men's and women's program at Christopher Newport University. Right what? Now. What? And what yeah. am I? What? Okay. So I played golf growing up. Oh my gosh. Oh this is so weird. Like what a yeah. small world. Okay. So I played golf. Yeah. I grew up in Herndon, Virginia, which is right outside yeah. of DC. I and I well. played golf my entire life. My dad was okay. a uh, professional golf teacher. And so I, I did not, now they did not have a women's team at CNU when I went there. Um, but correct. a couple my brother started the program. Yeah. So a couple of my dad's students play for CNU, which is just, that is hysterical. Like what are well, the odds coach, of that? Your coach is my little brother. So there you go. Oh my gosh. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. That is the most random, like small yeah. world. Like number one, people like have never, like there's so many people who are still like, you went to where? And I'm like, it's a really awesome school. Okay. It Christopher Newport is, is an amazing fantastic. school. Fantastic school. Yeah. Uh, former Senator Paul Tribble. Yeah. He's the president there, and he has transformed that uh, small little state I university know. into a powerhouse. It's an academic powerhouse. Yeah. So he was, so I was student body president and um, my senior oh. year, and I was really involved in at school. I'll like bet. I was highly involved. So, like, P Trib and I, we go, and his wife, Rosemary, is amazing. He's retiring okay. next year. And I know, uh, but yeah. they're just such good people. I loved, I, I like to this day, I mean, my, my husband went to UNC Chapel Hill. So, like, he went to this big, you know, yeah. Carolina, like, big, and we live obviously in the Carolina Duke area. And I'm like, seeing you like go captains um so the fact that one you've heard of my school and like know how awesome it is and two your little brother is the golf coach there who my dad coached some students who are on that that is like the most bizarre small so world cool. thing i'm so sorry and then it all started with the fact that you worked for the governor of virginia which i also did yeah. like what a weird yes. okay yeah. sorry we went down a total this rabbit hole i don't even care very exciting <laughs> know, but i'm okay. very excited about the whole thing it's i know i cool. love it okay go back so you're working yeah. for jim well, gilmore at the time <laughs> well yeah so i mean the point is is that i get into it and i and i get after it yeah very early success yeah i mean it's 
you know, I, I was a special assistant to the governor of Virginia at 22. Wow. You know, and it was in. And then got out because I, I thought, again, the best way to set myself up to run for office was to have a private sector resume. Yeah. Primarily business and business leadership. So pursued that path, wound up in Atlanta, Georgia, working for John Maxwell, the leadership guru. Yeah. Easily top five leadership authors of all time. And it was in that season that I thought that I was preparing to run in that area that I also discovered that I had lost the passion for mm. that work. And that yeah. was a very, I would say, equal parts freeing in that it was like, there was no question that I was struggling with the current state of politics. What I felt mm -hmm. was a bit of a sham yeah. based on what I, what I believed it could be mm -hmm. when I was, you know, in my early twenties mm -hmm. and then having seen it and feeling like, man, th th both sides of the aisle, because it was on both sides of the aisle. This is not a 100%. this is not a political philosophy statement. What I'm about to say, yeah, uh, I'm going to offend both sides if it's that. Yeah, but I just felt like both sides of the aisle, both parties had massive integrity issues mm -hmm. as it related to truly serving people. Yeah, and they were about themselves and their own power, not the people and progress. Okay, yeah. so that's I'm I'm calling out both parties for there. sure. If you for don't sure, agree with me? That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but. So I was really disheartened, but also freed that I was like, that's not it. I've been struggling with, is this it? Because I didn't think that was the place to be. And so when I got, when I got closure that it wasn't politics, the problem was I was left with a void yeah. and I'd been on purpose since I was 16. Yeah. And so there I sit, you know, early thirties going, uh, I know it's not politics, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Right. And so that was very confusing and, uh, and frustrating. Man, yeah, I it's it's funny how in in some ways my realization that you came to just happened a lot faster for me because <laughs> I right. I mean I was an English creative writing major in college. My actual dream job was to be on Saturday Night Live. Uh, so like I did comedy and that was all. But then I was Love a political that. science minor, and I was like, well, my practical thing is I'm just gonna like work in the public sector for a little while. And I got this. Um, so the way I worked for when I was working for uh, Governor Kane was it was through the governor's fellows program. And so it's like modeled after the White House fellows. And so it was like, I literally graduated from college, moved to Richmond the next day and started in the governor's office. And but this was in 2007, when the economy was beginning to just go in the you know what. And uh, I realized very quickly that I was like, this is not where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> this is I can't I am not meant to be this is way too buttoned up way too serious for me. And I this was not uh, I loved actually working for Governor Kane. He was a great, great guy. And uh, but my boss, like my direct boss, this is how I knew I was meant not meant to be there was I got pulled into his office one day. And he told me that I was my laughter was too disruptive. Hmm. <laughs> he said, hey, that's, that's, well, that's healthy leader. He said, right your laugh. I said, he said, I need to speak with you. He said, you, you have an extremely loud laugh. And I said, yes, I'm aware it's a genetic thing. And I, and yeah. I'm actually okay with it. Like, <laughs> and yeah. he was like, and it's disruptive and you need to stop laughing in the, in the workplace. At first oh. I thought I was being punked and I just genuinely thought I was like, there's no way that this is, Oh, no, he's actually being serious. Oh. But here's actually, and this is the one little tangent story, and then we're going to move on, and I'm really sorry. But this is something that I, th I thought was an interesting point of leadership. And this is not me being like, I think Tim Kaine's the greatest guy ever. But here's like the one thing that I was like, this was really powerful to me. So I walked out of that boss's office, and I was pretty dejected. Because all my life, I'd kind of been told, like, stay small, like, don't be, like, don't be you. you. <laughs> Yeah, Which I was like, right. that's ridiculous. But I right. for so long felt like I had to bottle myself up. And I didn't feel like I was like being crazy in the office. I just was a joyful person. And I was walking through the hallway and I was pretty dejected and actually happened to pass Governor Kane. So he's walking one direction. I'm walking the other direction. And he said, he stopped me and he said, Molly, he said, are you okay? You always have such a big smile on your face. And I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, and he said, what's wrong? And I just said, I, to be honest, uh, sir, uh, somebody told me my, my, my laugh is too much. And he goes, well, I love your laugh. <laughs> and he goes, don't ever, he was like, don't ever let anybody take the joy that God put inside of you. And I was like, thanks, thanks governor. And he just walked away. And I just, but I thought that was like a, such a, a humanistic moment 
of like this governor <laughs> to stop and I say this that. to like a intern. Um, anyway, so uh, I love that you kind of realized this and you began to kind of shift. And obviously, we're, we're going to fast forward a little bit. And now you're, you know, you work at Ramsey Solutions, you have this uh, just incredible job as kind of America's career coach, and you get to talk to people all the time about what it looks like to go from, uh, you know, just living paycheck to paycheck to really like living with purpose and and pursuing a career that uh, that fulfills you and that you were created to do. And you've got a book coming out. Actually, by the time this airs, it'll already be out, which is awesome. So tell us a little bit about it and what was sort of the um, the the motivation behind this book. Yeah. So where we left off is I was sharing that I was in this career crisis, yeah. a, a lack of clarity, yeah. having been on purpose. And now I'm in my early 30s and I'm six or seven years away from 40. And yeah. I have I feel like I'm starting a new path. Right. And it was terrifying. Yeah. Um, it was frustrating, debilitating. Pick all the things. Yeah. A little bit of exciting, but mostly awful because all of us, when we are in a place of the desert, we feel lost or we feel stuck. Right. It becomes all consuming because we either, if we're stuck, it's because we know where we want to go, but there are circumstances that are holding us back or beliefs that are holding us back. We'll probably get into some of that. Yeah. In my case, I was looking for total clarity. And so um, when you can't see through dense fog or a downpour of rain that's so heavy, you can't see past the hood of your car. That is frustrating. Yeah. And it's scary. Yeah. Right. It's scary first. Like, whoa, I'm pulling the car over. I got to stop. And so that's what I was going through. So uh, as I began the process of discovery and digging in, it took me a couple of years because I had a wife and three kids. Yeah. Under the age of three. Yeah. So I had to p- provide. And I was also in my early 30s. And I felt like I had wasted so much of my life mm. going one direction. Then as I began to get some clarity and some, my heart began to reveal broadcasting is something that I would love to do. That also felt a little bit delusional. Like, Ooh, I don't even have a degree in that. I don't have any experience in that. I'm now technically old to be starting into this thing, you know, all those things. Yeah. So as I began to stumble through the process, I did get clear and I got clear enough to be confident and that confidence stepped up. It, it showed up in times in my, in my journey, my seven and a half to eight year journey to Ramsey Solutions to give me the courage that I needed to stay on the path. Yeah. So that's the backstory. Yeah. So fast forward to where I am now, when I had truly decided in that seven to eight year journey that I wanted to do broadcasting, but not traditional broadcasting. I didn't want to I tried sports radio and sports television. I really enjoy sports. I can talk sports all day long. Yeah. But as I dabbled in it and tasted it and got experience in it, I realized that I had the talent for it. I had the passion for broadcasting and communicating publicly, but I didn't want to drive sports entertainment as my missional result. That's not the result that I really wanted to create and produce in the world. I wanted to produce transformation in the lives of people. Mm. And, and so it took several years. So now what I do on the, on the Ken Coleman show uh, daily is that I'm helping men and women get clear on what it is they were created to do and then help them do it to the peak. You know, I mean, purpose and peak performance is what I'm about. All right. right. So, so that's where I am. So I start that four years ago, we start the show Sirius XM. I'm live every day on Sirius XM opening for Dave Ramsey. Crazy, right? Had never done callers. I never uh, taken calls on air like this. I had to learn how to do it. I sucked really early on. In my opinion, I did, <laughs> but I was able to still help people, but I got better and better and better. So, you know, two years ago, I'm um, probably 3,000 calls in, a lot of experience. And I realized that when you're trying to help people with transformation, whether it be weight loss, relationships, like marriage, parenting, whatever, you're trying to get somebody from here across the gap from where they are to where they want to be. If you're driving transformation, people need a clear path. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because yep. they can go, yes, that's the mountaintop. Yes, I want my marriage to be resurrected. Or yes, I want to uh, lose 50 pounds or whatever it is. It, you know, Or right. yes, I want to be a better parent. Right. 
they can see the mountaintop. But what happens to all of us when we stare at this big high peak, this desired future, what happens instinctively is our eyes now we go from the top. Oh, yes, I would love to be on the top. That would be amazing. And then we kind of <laughs> scan our eyes down and we see how big and dark, unknown that mountain is. Mm -hmm. And so people, they can want to, but they won't do it if they don't see a clear path to where they go, okay, I see that there is a path to that desired future. So when I realized that, I said, okay, how would I distill the biggest question that people ever ask in their life down to a clear path? And yeah. that question is, why am I here? What should I do with my life? Right. And so I got out on the beach one morning with a pencil and a moleskin, and uh, it's just me in the ocean. And it was early. No one was out there around me. And I just said, Coleman, how would you describe the journey to a 17-year-old dude? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, that, that kid's got no attention span. He's immature. He doesn't, he can't even see it. So how do I describe it to that kid? And I began to write. And that's when we came up with the seven stages. I mean, I, I came back and tightened it up a little bit, but it was, I wrote it out like this, get clear, get qualified, get connected, mm -hmm. started, get promoted, get the dream job. And it was later that I came up with the seventh stage, give yourself away, mm. where in that seventh stage, when you're in the dream job, you're also in that seventh stage, give yourself away because you are now working for impact, not income. Income is there, notoriety is there, whatever that looks like for you in that dream job, but it's all about impact. Yeah. Showing up because of the missional result. So right. as you know, we unpack all seven stages in detail in the book. Uh, but that's that's why I wrote this book because I wanted to to put something out in the marketplace that I can guarantee. Yeah. I can't guarantee that you'll love the book. I can't guarantee how many it's going to sell. But here's what I can guarantee for a person who's kind of sure or very sure, but not sure how to get there. Uh, for the person who's sure what they're supposed to do, they know how to get there, but past failure finances or family is kind of holding you back. Let me tell you what I can promise you. This book will show you the way. Yeah. It will show you the way up to your professional pinnacle Yeah, where you will experience purpose and do the thing that you were created to do. Yeah. You know, I think, I mean, there's a whole reason I obviously host a show called Business with Purpose as this is such a big passion of mine is to, um, you know, my goal each and every week as I interview all different kinds of entrepreneurs and thought leaders and authors and speakers and just people all across the career spectrum. I mean, I've interviewed optometrists uh, who are using their passion and purpose to impact lives in uh, developing countries and, you know, traveling there and doing, um, performing, you know, eye exams and, and surgeries for people who don't have access to those types of things. So people can see, um, I mean, people like that to, uh, people like you who are, who are coaching people in their careers or people who have started these incredible nonprofits. And, you know, the, the general thread that I try to, to, to tell people is we weren't all very, very clearly, we were not all created to do the same thing. Whatever faith perspective people have, you know, I obviously come as a, a believer in, in the Lord Jesus, um, you know, my my belief, but I think this is something that no matter what your faith perspective is, you cannot deny that we were all intricately created in such a unique way with unique purposes and unique passions and unique desires and unique creativities. And some of us are, you know, left brain people and some of us are right brain people and some of us like spreadsheets and some of us never want to touch a spreadsheet and all those kinds of things. And it's figuring out how you can best mesh your talents um, and, and skills and abilities and not trying to like fit, you know, a, a square peg in a round hole kind of situation, uh, mm -hmm. along with, you know, a need in the marketplace um, and things like that. And I, I was laughing the other day uh, on your show, you talked about somebody who'd called in who wanted to like leave his job so that he could be a pet vacation assistant mm, or something yes. like that. And you were just, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. For people that did not hear that on your show, it was like this guy that said that he, people will pay him to travel with their pets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was, uh, to this day, I'm not sure it wasn't a setup. <laughs> it wasn't some type of punk situation. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's the only 
person that comes to my mind <clears throat> that I felt was completely delusional if in fact that he was being true blue. Yeah. But yeah, he was like when I started walking through the the get clear process, you know, that we write about in chapters one and two, yeah. you got to get clear on what you do best talent. You got to <laughs> get clear on the work you want to do passion. You got to get clear on the results you want to produce through your work mission. So I'm walking him through all this. And I said, what comes to mind? And Cause we, he kind of listed out these things. And, and, and I said, I think you're really thinking about something and you're just kind of afraid to say it. So he blurts that out. And I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> You know, because I, I, I literally questioned him on the air. I was like, is that a thing? He's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like. Yeah, you're like, I don't think it is. I think. Yeah, because for further clarification, I thought he meant that he would go on vacation with families and take care of the pets so that they can go out. And, right. You know, they're skiing all day. And he sits in the lodge and takes care of Rover. Like right. This was where my mind went. <laughs> but he was like, no, no, no. I take their pet on trips. Yeah. Just me and their pet. And to this day, I don't believe that there's one sane person on the no. planet that would that would pay someone to do that because no. the pet doesn't know where they are. No. They, don't, they don't even know. They don't even care. <laughs> so that was a wacky situation. Oh, but, I know. know. It really made me laugh. Um, but, it, you know, by it, the it, way, the moral of that story is, is that no matter how passionate are you to help people, you're not going to be able to help everybody. So right. let it go. Right. And I think, and the other thing too, that I kind of took away from that too, was, was just this idea of, and I, I think it speaks really to your number one point of getting clear, but also finding like, okay, so you have, so, you, okay, maybe it's like, let's peel back the layers of this onion. It's like, okay, so maybe you love animals uh, and mm -hmm. maybe you love to travel. Like, <laughs> okay, so let's find a legit need in that like maybe you become a veterinarian who travels like that's probably a thing uh Possibly. or you know beginning to think like okay so here's here's this passion that you have over here mm -hmm. what's an actual need that somebody might have um that's it. you know and so uh but i think that that's just something that is so top of mind for so many people right now because you know, whether we want to talk about it or not, the reality of the current environment that we're living in is you've got people who have been laid off, but then you've got all these companies who, for some reason, have all these open positions and can't find anybody to fill them. You've got people who are willingly uh, resigning. You've got kind of what you title like the great resignation. Um, and it's my husband is a financial advisor and he and I have had conversations over the last couple of months where we're both just our heads hurt, like thinking about like what this job economy is bizarre. Like it's just I feel like nothing like we've ever seen before. And so you have people who are like, well, I got laid off during COVID. And so I'm going to go like start a company. But now here they are like, you know, 18, 20 months in and like they haven't done it or they're, they're still not employed. But then you've got like the restaurant down the street that's closing two days a week because they don't have enough people to staff it. Mm -hmm. It's just a mo like, I don't know. So I, I don't, I don't even know really what my question is. It's just more like, what do you think is the thing that is kind of contributing to that right now? You know, you know, pet vacation assistant aside, but what do you what have you kind of seen in your conversations with people and just in, in your area of expertise in the career force, career world? Um, sure. Like, what is what do you think is driving that? Well, prior to the pandemic, Harvard Business Review uh, put out a study and a report that said that nine out of 10 people would consider making less money in order to do more meaningful work. Hmm. So that's just one study that illustrates this is not a new concept. Right. It's not a new thing. And so this is prior to the pandemic. What the pandemic did is take something that was already underneath the surface for every human being, mm. because I believe we were created to contribute. I open up the show every day by saying you were created to fill a unique role in your work. You are needed. You must do it. Somebody out there needs you to show up and be the best version of you. Mm. So you and I share a very similar theology, I'm guessing, that we were actually created to work. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean we're espousing being a workaholic. Right. What we're saying is, is we were created to contribute. We were given talent. We were put within us passion, uh, a love of doing a task that we get so excited thinking about that task or that role. When we're in the middle of it, time seems to disappear. Yeah. And then we all long to contribute to the lives of others. 
So that's the mission piece, talent, passion, mission. That's getting clear. That's purpose. You are on purpose when you use what you do best, talent, yeah. to do work you love, passion, to produce results that matter to you, mission. Okay. So that was already there. That's in us. What the pandemic did, there were two major things mm -hmm. that has now created this great resignation is what the economists are calling it. But we saw 4.3 million people leave their jobs in August. Yeah. Here's what the pandemic did. The pandemic heightened that thread in us that I just outlined because we were forced to make the biggest change we'd ever made in our lives. It was, there was no option. It was boom, you're going home. Everybody's going home. You either were laid off, furloughed, or told to go home. Right. Your kids weren't in school. I mean, it was a absolute change in our lives. Right. Well, change has so much unknown attached to it. And I think the greatest fear we humans have is the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Not fear of failure, not fear of rejection. I think the fear of the unknown. It like speaks to that, that mountain analogy you were using. It's like if there's not a clear path yeah, up the and, mountain and you don't know what you're facing, that's terrifying. That's it. So what the pandemic did was force change on us. And we were like, oh, okay. Well, I've had to change in every other area of my life. What other changes do I want to make? Right. Right. We saw people buying Pelotons like crazy, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and, and then those, so change, we got more comfortable with change than we normally are. Okay. That's the first fact. The second factor is we were forced to face our mortality and face the preciousness of life mm. and how quickly it can change because we were hearing reports yeah. of deaths every day globally. Yeah. I mean, you could, you turn on CNN and they had a ticker for crying out loud, Yeah, you know, just counting the deaths. I mean, it was just in our faces. Yeah. And so you take those two factors, we were forced to deal with wholesale change. And then we were also confronted with mortality and how precious life is. And that, is making people just go, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Man, what, yeah. what other changes do I want to make? Life's too short to just go get a paycheck. So I think those are your two major factors that the pandemic brought to the table. And all it did was just dig up all that stuff that you and I believe is underneath of us just waiting to come out anyway. And that's yeah. a longing to, to do meaningful work. You know, and as you were talking, just kind of as I, I was thinking about how just in general, I mean, we saw it again, uh, to echo your point is like, we saw that heightening and magnification of so many things in our lives because of the pandemic. And I, I think about like, you, you know, I know one of the things that you talk about a lot is like the five reasons why people want to leave their jobs, like lack of passion, a toxic workplace, they're overwhelmed, they're underappreciated, they're bored. All of that gets super magnified because especially like especially point number two or three when you're in a toxic workplace maybe you have a boss who's just a a son of a gun you know uh or a, a toxic workplace where you've got uh just really brash personalities all those kinds of things or you're in a toxic workplace where you're you're overworked already and then now all of a sudden you're dealing with those personalities and those toxic things in that environment and that overworking in a pandemic, like, of course, all of those things are going to get way worse. And so it probably gets, it becomes this like powder keg where it's just waiting to, to explode. Um, and, but that's just funny that, cause I hadn't really thought of it in that respect of just what are the things that are kind of, you know, just lurking under the surface that then come out, um, come out of that. And so, you know, obviously there's, we can kind of talk all day about the, the pros and cons of those sorts of things and like, okay, well maybe it is time. And I think of that, uh, you know, just, just the, the whole idea of like, whatever is covered will one be once become uncovered. Like, you yeah. know, it's just, you can't, you can't hide all these things forever. Um, and so obviously there's pros to people leaving and saying, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do the thing. I'm going to start the business. Like maybe I've got, maybe I got a good severance or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that can be the thing that leads me to, to invest in that business I wanted to start or whatever. But then, you know, you, you've got the bad side of it where you see all these small businesses who are having to close their doors because they can't hire anybody or they're, nobody's coming into their, their stores. Um, nobody's coming into their, I mean, one of our favorite restaurants here uh, where we live, like they're closing two days a week because they they just don't have the staff. And, 
so it's just it's it's such an interesting thing. Now on the flip side, and this is gonna I don't know uh, what you kind of think about this, but there's a lot of people that maybe stay in a job that they don't want to be in because they think they're indispensable. Like they think that uh, even though they want to do something else, like they think that the comp, like they think that like the the weight of the company rests on their shoulders. Like they're indispensable. Their the, their employer is gonna just if they quit, that's it. Like the everything's over. Uh, and that and that feeling just gets kind of exacerbated when they see that hiring is tough. So like maybe they work at a company where they're having a hard time hiring, and so this person kind of carries that, and so they don't leave when they should. Because they, again, they feel like the company is going to fail without them. So how do you get or what do you think about people who are kind of in that position? Um, and I know that my, like my husband, like I said, he's a financial advisor and he's seen this a lot with some of his clients who have maybe been in their job for 20, 30 years and can retire and kind of choose not to because they think their company is going to fail without them. Or like they want to kind of make a big career change and they they don't because they feel like their company is going to fail without them. How do you kind of talk to people? I'm sure you've talked to people over the years, like to get them to come to terms with that they're actually replaceable. <laughs> that yeah. at the end of the day, we're, well, we're replaceable. Yeah, we all are. I, I think there's two things going on. I mean, I get this call a lot on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh. I, I think there's a bit of codependency probably going on mm. there, a little bit of messianic complex, yeah. probably part of the cocktail. Uh, there's also some good heartedness there, you know, like, yeah. hey, I don't want to leave anybody right. worse. They were good right. to me. I, I, it's usually coming from a good place. Right. But I think the other element there is, is a lot of times it's a good excuse. Mm. It's a good excuse to not step into the unknown. It's a good excuse to kind of say, oh, I'm not afraid. I'm just a good person. Yeah. Think about that, right? I'm, oh, I'm I'm not I'm not scared. I I'm not doubtful about the next step. I'm a good person, and I'm going to say no to my dreams because I am such a good person. Yeah. Because I just I'm the glue. Do you hear how silly and ridiculous oh, that's? Oh yeah. But that's exactly what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Even though they're not saying it that way, and my silly. That was my attempt to show you that I could have made it on Saturday night. I think you definitely could. But, you have you missed your I think you missed your calling. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I could have been Stuart Smalley's positive brother. Yes. But uh, you know, <laughs> I, it's a big crutch. Yeah. So I think you have to look at it like this. Is there a desired future? Is there purpose in that desired future? Yeah. If the answer is yes, then guess what? Everything's gonna be okay. Mm-hmm. Whether they bless you cheer for you when you leave or whether they get upset and hurt and say awful things about you when you leave. None of that is what matters. What matters is, are you living and working on purpose? And when you live and work on purpose, I've got news for you. You will leave people behind. Yeah. Yep. That's the price of admission. So that would be my overall response. But my bumper sticker thing would be, get over yourself. You're going to be fine. (laughs) They're going to be fine. (laughs) They'll figure it out. Yeah. It's not your problem. Now, that doesn't mean you leave like a jerk. No, for sure. Walk in and drop your fob and go deuces and walk out with the goldfish. Yeah. But at the same time, spare yourself this nonsense that you're going to leave them in such an awful lurch because you're so amazing. Yeah. That's so funny. Also, like random, but that's the second Jerry Maguire reference I've heard today. And it is 9.45 in the morning at the time of well, this recording. Well, that to me is a good day. Which is a good day. It there's just, so many references from Jerry Maguire that we should this is just all really funny. drop in. I'm going to try to work in one more. I got I, one in my mind. I love it. But I'm only going to drop it in if it makes sense. If it makes see sense. how the rest of the conversation I love it. It was really funny. Yeah, I was listening to, because I'm a big fan of uh, The Office. And mm-hmm. I was listening to The Office Ladies podcast this morning while I was doing my farm chores. And it was the oh. episode where Michael Scott puts in his two-week notice and he does the like Jerry Maguire, like who's coming with me who's coming with me and anyway so just funny that i happen to have two uh goldfish references before 9 45 a.m okay so i want to go back to you said something earlier in the show that i was like oh i'm putting a pin in that in my my brain because i want to come back to that and this was something that was a feeling that you'd had 
in your early 30s, when you were beginning to kind of wrestle with this, I think I'm actually doing currently what I'm not supposed to be doing and wrestling with this like idea of a career change and and all that kind of stuff. And one of the thoughts that you shared that you had where I was like, I've wasted a lot of my life going in a direction that I wasn't supposed to be going. And, you know, I'm in my later 30s now, which I love my 30s, by the way, no problem with my 30s. But now that I'm in my as my 77 year old father likes to tell me he's like, you're well into your 30s. Um, But I think that there is this pervasive mindset that we see where we feel like for whatever reason, whether it's media that's told us this or our grandmother who's disappointed in us or whatever, that we are, we are supposed to have it all figured out by the, by the age of 26. Okay, you got to have your career, you got to plan for your marriage, and you got to get started on the babies, and you got to buy the house and all this stuff. Like you have to figure it all out. Now, there's also some people that get in that. What's that phrase? It was like a movie with the old guy. He's like in his 40s living in his parents' basement. What's that? Arrested Development almost like, I mean, all the, another great show uh, where people then put off sort of the other things like marriage and family and all this mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. in favor of career. And then all of a sudden they're 50 and they're like, oh, wait, what have I been doing? So the, there's a balance to be struck. But I think that that feeling of, oh, well, I've wasted my life doing one thing in your 30s. When in reality, like in perspective and now like looking back kind of on that season, you're like, oh, no, it's just all those other skill sets were kind of training you and giving you the life experience to be where you are. What is your advice or your perspective or or kind of words of wisdom to share with somebody who is maybe at that point in their life, maybe they're in their 40s and they're like, I hate my job. And I feel like I've been doing this one career for 20 years and I hate it. And I've been going in the wrong direction. I actually want to do this other thing. You know, I always like to go to the examples of like Morgan Freeman, who like didn't get hired on his first major motion picture till he was in his 50s. Or Oprah, who had, you know, gotten fired from her job as like a local news anchor, you know, or Barack Obama, who was a a, like a community organizer at the age of 23. Like all these people who kind of had these just run of the mill jobs or failed experiences, but then actually like in in retrospect, it, it led them to where they are. Yeah. Well, a couple things. As I now look back on that season. Yeah. I, that was a feeling, not a fact. Mm-hmm. I had not wasted my life. I had done a lot. And I had, you mentioned the two words in your question. What you have to do is, is you look back and say, what skills did I acquire? What experience did I gain? Yeah. And those skills and that experience from whatever your journey has been, whether it's been on purpose in your mind or not, those are there and you can build on those. Mm. And then I also think that the mindset's got to be, if you're 42 or 50 and you're about ready to be on purpose in your work for the first time in your life, there's no regret there. Yeah. None at all. Can't be. Because the, the, the mindset to do that, to do that thing you feel in your heart you're supposed to do, the mindset's got to be, well, it's all focused on that mountaintop, that peak. And so mm-hmm. my focus has got to be on that. I'm not looking behind. I'm looking forward. So you'll, you, you will hold yourself back and potentially sabotage yourself if you're constantly looking back. I mean, once you get a clear eye on the mountaintop, your eyes are on that. You're not looking at anything else. Mm. You're not looking at, I mean, let's just, I, I watch these, uh, these documentaries on Mount Everest because I write about, as you know, yeah. Sir Edmund Hillary, yeah. uh, you know, which I think embodies this whole journey I write about in the book. So I, I'm fascinated by all this mountain climbing stuff. It's just great teaching, it's it great is. metaphors. So it I is. love it. So I watch all these things. I I wouldn't climb a mountain if you paid me. It's just I'm not an outdoorsman. <laughs> I mean, look at me for crying out loud. I like 700 thread count sheets. You know, what I mean? so, um, you know, I love the outdoors. I just don't want to sleep in them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like I'll go rough and tumble all day, but I need a hot shower, a really nice mattress, yeah. and comfy sheets. You yeah. know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 Like, eh, really, do we need to sleep outside under the stars on the hard ground? I don't. I don't. Yeah. I, if that makes you feel like more of a man, good for you. I feel very manly as I'm curled up yeah. uh, inside a, a air controlled room. So yeah. but the point is, is that when when these mountain climbers are on the side of that hill or that mountain, they're not looking back. Right. They're completely focused in the now. Yeah. If they take their eyes off of the now, they die. Hmm. Uh, at worst. Right. 
at best, they slow themselves down. Right. Uh, and, and so that's the point here. Don't spend all your time, you know, soaking on the past. Learn from it. Yeah. Filter what you learn and move on. Yeah. Man, that's good. Man, Ken, I could, I could, I have like 75 other questions I want to ask you, um, but well, I know we're running out of time. Up. I know, I know. And I know, I know we're running out questions. of time. I know. It's, I, you know, I would, I got busy typing. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, but now is obviously before we leave uh, for the listeners, I'm going to have uh, Ken's information, how you can listen to his uh, show podcast. And of course, a link to the book in the show notes. Be sure to check him out. Uh, he's just awesome. And clearly he and I have like some r- very random small world things in common. Uh, so uh, I love it. All right. But before we go, now is the time where I get to just ask some fun get to know you questions. So Ken, are you oh. ready for the get to know you round? I don't know, but I'm going to give it you'll, everything I got. I think you'll be fine. You'll just be just fine. Okay. Don't worry, but won't be too scared. Whew. All right. Question number one is what is currently on your most played playlist on Spotify or Apple Music or whatever you listen to? A song by Elevation Worship entitled Waiting on You or Wait on So you. Good. It's uh, love from that their song. basement uh, album. It's fantastic. I love the old church basement album. So, That's it. Thank so you. good. Yeah. Yeah. So Such good. Such a good song. I love it. Love it. Excellent choice. Okay. Uh, one day when a movie is made about you in your life, who would you want to play you in a movie? Uh, Jason Sudeikis. <laughs> I love Jason Sudeikis. Are you a Ted Lasso fan? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. The best. Uh, be yeah. a goldfish. Yeah. Be a yeah. goldfish. I, yeah. Love, love that show. Love it. Okay. Um, what if you were to describe true generosity by using an example that you yourself had have witnessed? What would you say? Um, true generosity that I have witnessed. You know, I think the greatest generosity I've personally witnessed is Dave Ramsey. Mm. Um, last year, he gave away over a million dollars hmm. uh, at Christmas time to uh, our team members, wow. to uh, the staff that serves our food here every day. A lot of them single moms paid off a bunch of strangers debt. Hmm. You know, that's his own money. And he's also generous with his own platform that he built by yeah. bringing me in here and putting me on top of a fence post. I'm like a turtle on top of a fence post. <laughs> I didn't. You know, I didn't get here by myself. So I, I think that's what comes to mind mm, is giving, love- giving away something you don't have to give away yeah. uh, and going beyond generosity. I love that example. And that's something that, I mean, my, you know, my husband's, uh, he owns his own small business. I'm self-employed. I'm my only employee. Um, but you know, he's at the end of the day, like, obviously we are, we care a lot about giving and he's like, but one of the things that he loves the most is being able to bless the people who work for him. And he's like, I think at the end of the day, like you need to take care of your people who take care of you. And that's such a, I love that example of just of Dave kind of giving away money to his, his staff and the, and the people who kind of help run the day to day. And, and that's awesome. That's awesome. All right. And then this is my last question. This is the question I ask all my guests and it is, Ken, what does it mean to you to run a business with purpose? You have to never lose sight of the problem that you started the business to solve. Hmm. So if you want to run a business with purpose, you never lose sight of that. Yeah. You, you must always have that initial problem, no matter how big you get, no matter how diversified the business gets. If you lose sight of the reason you started the business, which was to ultimately provide a product or service that solves a problem. Right. And there's a person on the other end of the problem. If you don't lose sight of that, you'll, you'll never lose your purpose in business. But when you lose sight of that, then you lose. And the best example of that is to me is Blockbuster. Yeah. God bless them. They forgot what yeah. their purpose was. Yep. Their purpose was to make it easy for people to be entertained at home. Yep. Watching a movie. Yep. And Netflix came along and they were like, <sighs> yep. And they forgot the problem about the problem they were trying to solve. And so they didn't adjust and they went out of business. Yep. Such so a great that's example. my answer. Don't lose sight of the simple why we do what we do. I took a question on this at an Entree Leadership event last year and a guy I taught on purpose and a guy stood up and he goes, Ken, I love what you taught. It makes total sense about having a purpose day. But the problem is I'm a, I'm a house painter. What's my why? And I got all excited and I said, you don't know your why? He goes, no, man, I, I just paint houses. I go, really? I go, why do people call you to paint their houses? Well, because they need to be painted. I go, yeah, but why? 
why not just let the paint chip off? Well, they're going to resell it. Oh, okay. Okay. What's another reason? Well, because they want it to look nice. They want to change it. They buy a house and they fix it up and they want to be proud of it. I go, oh, okay, okay. I said, so why are you a house painter? And the whole audience started laughing. Yeah. And I said, you're not, you're not a house painter. You're a dream maker. Yeah. You're helping dreams come true, man. You just don't see it that way. But you painting a house is a part of making a dream come true, whether it be financial gain or just them being very proud to show off their house because it's the house they always wanted. So that's an example of the why. That's purpose. Ah, I love it. Ken, this has been so much fun. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all you do to impact so many people each and every day. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, and it was just great to connect with you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Friend, I would love to know what you loved about this episode or something that you learned. Find me on social media. I'm at Still Being Molly or at Business with Purpose Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And don't forget to use that hashtag Business with Purpose Podcast when you're sharing the show with a friend. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. If you are a first time listener of the show, welcome. Be sure to check out the archives for past shows featuring so many incredible entrepreneurs, business owners, community leaders who are changing the world. If you are a regular listener of the show, Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for tuning in week in and week out. Be sure to head on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Radio Public, Overcast, Stitcher, basically wherever you get your podcasts, click that subscribe or follow button. To click that button means you will never miss a new episode of the show. And while you're there, would you take a moment to just leave a review? Would you take a moment to maybe share one of your favorite episodes with a friend? Leaving a review, sharing the show with a friend, it is totally free for you and it is the biggest help for me in the entire world. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. It just also helps me to know what you're liking and how the show is impacting you. As always, this show is produced by the incredible team at Third Wheel Media. Thank you so much for listening. Now go do something good with purpose on purpose.